You are listening to the SDSU Football Podcast, presented by the East Village Times with your hosts, Andre Hagverdian and Paul Garrison. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of the SDSU Football Podcast. I am Andre Hagverdian, and I'm joined by Paul Garrison. What's going on, Paul? Nothing, man. I'm hanging out. Just finished up the spring game. And, you know, looking forward to, to just sharing some of the thoughts, man. How are you? I'm doing great as well. It was really nice to um, take in the spring game on uh, on Thursday night. Uh, it was the first time in three years that it was open to the public. Fans were allowed to come. A lot of people were there. Uh, more people than I thought, than I expected. I don't know about you. Um, the bleachers were full. Uh, there was a lot of people in the in the on the sidelines and in the walking areas hanging out. So it was a it was a full house for sure. Yeah, I I expected there to be a lot of people. I actually thought that they might get a might get to a point where it was actually going to be a problem because there were going to be too many people there. You know, um, where I was um, took three of my kids along with me, and where we were sitting which was as far um, away from the entrance as you could possibly be. There were three rows deep of people, um, the first row sitting completely on their butts, and then the next row behind them kneeling, and the next row behind them kind of squatting. And so it was three rows deep and then a little bit of space between the bleachers, and it was that way all the way down. Um, so kudos to you know San Diego State. I think it shows a lot of momentum um, going towards uh, – you know, the new stadium opening the stadium, but then also just that they chose to have it there as opposed to like, you know, the soccer stadium up at the very top that wouldn't have given it that same um, buzz and feel. Um, So I thought, I thought it was, I thought it was a really, really good event. I thought um, just all of the different pieces fit really well. um, And it seemed like everybody's just attitudes and things of that nature were, were really high for the night. Before we get into the actual game itself, I'm, I'm curious what the future plan for the spring game is, whether they are looking to keep it at the practice facility and keep it that little small, you know, thousand people kind of feel to it, or if they're going to open that up and put it to Snapdragon Stadium, you know, for next spring. Uh, What do you think about that? Well, I mean, I think that they have to, they have a lot of decisions in front of them, I would say. So if you look at all of the other, posts that schools put out schools um uh uh, recruits from different schools they'll show them inside of their football stadium you know on their official visits and things of that nature and san diego state obviously has not been able to do that um and so they're going to have that opportunity to make sure recruits get out to the field etc but i think that in the article um you know that came out just afterwards you know the the atmosphere after the spring game um, was like so much in the San Diego state uh, football program, a throwback to older days. I mean, you talk to um, some older Aztecs who talk about, um, you know, what it was like playing on campus um, before they moved into Jack Murphy stadium and the access that they had with the players and um, all of the things that went in it. And after the spring game was the closest thing to that experience that I have seen. Um, It was absolutely a family friendly celebration of everything that is Aztec football. If, if you're a local kid, and in fact, you know, I, in the article, I talked with Jax Leatherwood about this. If you're a local kid and you get to come to the spring game And afterwards, you get to see all of the coaches, all of the high school coaches, all of the family, all of the friends get to, you know, come out of the stands, go onto the field, take pictures. Hey, how are you? Hugs and all of that. It it turns the recruiting pitch from, hey, imagine your family and friends being there to having a living, breathing actual example of what that would be like. And so I think that they have to make sure that whatever they do, 
they can keep that element of it because I think that is probably the biggest thing that came out of the spring game for me. Yeah, Braxton Bur- Burmeister, when we interviewed him after the game on the field, you know, he was asked about, you know, the atmosphere and being a hometown kid. And he talked about how this is the first time his parents had been at his spring game, um, obviously at Oregon and, and Virginia Tech. His parents, you know, didn't make those trips out there. And this and how cool it was for him to experience, you know, his, his, his parents and the rest of his family being here in person for his, you know, for uh, his spring game for the first time ever. So I thought that was a, a cool argument. So it was Team Pumphrey, Team Donnell Pumphrey versus Team uh, Brian Sipe. Pumphrey, Team Pumphrey won 28 to 6 uh, in a route. Uh, but I don't think anybody uh, was complaining about the lopsided score based on, you know, what we were able to see, especially in the passing game. What were your main, uh, you know, thoughts and takeaways from, from the overall game? Well, from the game itself, um, I guess one other little thing. Um, congratulations to you. I believe that spring game last year was your first EVT SDSU media event that you covered in person. So being able to do that now twice, exactly. right? Kind of makes like a full year year thing yeah. there. So congratulations, big time. Um, lots of really, really yeah, good yeah. Um, people who are trying to cover their first SDSU media event. And, you know, you're obviously going through on to the second part. So congrats to that. Um, completely different than last year. Um, you know, we uh, had a little bit of a better view because there was nobody there. So they let us go and basically be the people on the sidelines. You know, we're just confined to the end zones, um, but could move up and down and throughout the side and stuff like that. So I thought that just that contrast, you know, with, with only a few people there, I think they could give a couple tickets to their family members and things like that. Everybody's sitting apart. Um, it was still the uh, weird part of the pandemic where nobody had been outside. Um, and so nobody knew what to do and when talk to each other, you know, all kinds of stuff was there. So it was just like, it was dead. And then the game itself was, was, was really difficult. I mean, there was only like a, like a, broken pass a broken play pass um that could have been intercepted it was a tip ball ethan dodo comes down with it and scores and that's the only score of the entire the three game so being able to actually kind of track a football game again i mean this would be one of the from the college level right i mean there hasn't been too many games in san diego over the last couple of years and so to, to be able to actually have that feel of an actual game and things like that, to be able to say, okay, he's playing well, he's not playing well. Um, I think that just in general was a big takeaway um, because, you know, I think that that was the frustration with the offense over the last few years is they just didn't look like they were a division one offense at times. And I think especially, um, and especially going up against, you know, Kurt Maddox's defense, um, they didn't look like they really had it together very much at all. Um, even, you know, so just for the offense to perform as well as it did, I I think is just the the huge thing. And, and which you definitely sit on and talk about a little bit longer. Yeah. I mean, ultimately the game itself was light years different than last year. I mean, last year's, I believe last year's was a day game on a, on a, Mm -hmm. on a weekend. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was hot. Uh, mm-hmm. Sun was in every was in you know face, and obviously t- this time around is an evening. The sun was at play kind of in the beginning, but once it set, it became the 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 atmosphere and the setting was 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 great for football. So as far as the game in and of itself, um, you know, I think it it's really interesting because when you look at the quarterback room, um, nothing I would argue got really solved at the spring game. Um, The worst quarterback that on scholarship, I should say um, that played was Braxton Burmeister. Like statistically um, even just kind of the eyeball tests and that sort of thing. It looked like after the first couple of possessions that he wasn't going to come back in, then he came back in and he was inaccurate and looked cold and all that kind of stuff. And so um, if you're looking for this idea that Braxton Burmeister is you know, going to come in and be the savior and he's going to be so far above everybody else. 
then you look at his numbers and you realize that they were really close to what Jordan Brookshire and um, Lucas Johnson and Jalen Maiden did um, the year before. So there's that kind of angle. Then there's the angle of that, you know, this is this last game was the um, best competition that Will Haskell has played that has been open to the public, right? Um, in the other scrimmages that, that, you know, even open to the media that we saw him playing, um, you know, he, he's playing against guys who were just in high school or in the 24 some odd snaps that he had played in during the year. It was always at garbage time and he looked really good. Um, he looked really good. He got, um, I mean, some of the catches that the receivers were able to make, um, thinking of, I think it was uh, Ronald Gilliam, like um, he, he threw it towards like right almost where the entrance was and just pulled yeah. it out of the air. I mean, he, I mean, um, Haskell just absolutely chucked the ball and showed off his arm strength. Um, and, you know, you always think with, with Haskell that if the quarterbacks are live, there's an extra element that he's going to be able to bring. And so like, I think if you're, if, if you're a fan and you're in that idea that, that, you know, there's this contingent out there that think that um, seemingly that Hoke and Heklinski have, have forgotten how to coach and they pick the wrong quarterback every year and they should have picked Haskell, I guess, based off of watching videos off of sports center or something. I don't know where <laughs> that opinion of him comes from, but if you were, if you're in that camp of who, the, of, of, of that way of thinking, you go into this game and you're just like, see, he's the best quarterback. But then you have the next question. Why did Lee Uamavai throw better than Will Haskell did <laughs> against the same defense? Right. And Kyle Crum struggled against the same defense that Braxton Burmeister struggled in. And then of course, in the article that, that, that came out or I gave my, some of my um, thoughts about it, you realize that Patrick Wing Morris was only played for one team and the team that Patrick Wing Morris played for one and only gave up six points um, and, you know, could have given up nine on a, you know, field goal that was missed. So I think it just, wherever you kind of, whatever evaluation people make of the quarterback position, I think there was enough in that game to justify any way you want to take it, um, including that Braxton Burmeister is, um, you know, a step below a professional quarterback and is going to be really good for the Aztecs this year because he looked in control. He looked confident. He made some good throws early, beating McMorris with a couple of, of passes um, to 87. And um, just like I said, you, you, you can make an argument anyway. So how did you see it? Burmeister after the game said something interesting about how he didn't think he, pl- he got too much playing time. And the three receivers that he has been predominantly working with at practice were split up. I didn't think he his statistics obviously were the were the lowest compared to the other guys. I didn't necessarily think he played poorly. Uh, a lot of circumstances. That play you said to Gus McGee was uh, he scrambled, bought some time, and found McGee, you know, down um, uh, to the to the right hand side towards the sideline. Yes. I think that play called got called back because of a. Uh, a penalty, either a holding penalty or something. He, he, I, I like how he scrambles. I like how he makes quick mm-hmm. decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's interesting because you would probably think that Burmeister, uh, Berkshire, and Lucas Johnson are more athletic, are, are more athletic, or potentially even faster than Burmeister. But I don't necessarily think that's the case. No. Uh, and Burmeister makes faster decisions when the play is no not question. there. He's moving. His feet are moving. He's decisive. Um, and I think, you know, he's, I think he was five for nine for 40 yards or something like that. I, I don't make too much of, of that um, no. necessarily to say, oh, he shouldn't be the starter because he had a couple bad, you know, he only scored, you know, led to three points on four drives. That, that's what I would make of his performance. I think it's more about what the younger guys did and how well they played more so than, you know, Burmeister didn't have good numbers, so he shouldn't be the quarterback. I don't necessarily look at that way. No, I agree with you. And that's definitely how I would take it. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, Hoke, Heklinski, um, all of the 
court and all the pieces. And when we had our conversation with um, Coach Eklinski and he talked about all of the different voices that are involved in the decision making um, and the game planning and all of those kinds of things. Um, you know, there's tons of experience in that room. They see what these quarterbacks do day in and day out. But I did think that, you know, Hoke said after the game that he was really happy with the way Haskell played because he's been up and down. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I think that's the, I think the, the coaching staff, um, you know, for better or for worse, the up and down nature that Johnson and Brookshire kind of put them through the last couple of years. I think they're going to put a premium on somebody who's going to be um, predictable. And, 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 you know, there is, there are fewer players in, in, in the conference who have a bigger upside than Haskell. I think we can agree on that. Um, and what Crum and Amavai's, you know, upside is, I'm not sure, but the idea that, Braxton Burmeister is going to be able to come in and be that steadying hand for the offense, I think is, is really key. And the fact that they could see that day in and day out um, throughout camp, um, I think speaks volume. So I think that they would have gotten more points. Obviously they had the long miss field goal. He led them to one field goal drive. And then, you know, he drops, he drops a snap. Right. And that just, you know, kills a drive and, you know, those mistakes happen. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put, very much weight in anything that goes on except to say that for years we've been told about how the defense is so far ahead of the offense and how the defense is you know so complicated and how the defense is good and all of these kind of ideas after watching these and paying attention maybe in a little bit different way than I had in years past you know, those is a very vanilla defense that they faced out there. There, there was not a lot of scheming. There was not a lot of, it was just line up and play and inside of, you know, you're not going to get hit. There's no threat of getting hit. I mean, it's, it's as close to seven on seven Skelly as these quarterbacks will ever get right. There's, there's no one's is shy about taking a shot. No, you're going to be able to, you know, unload at every moment you're not worried about anybody doing anything to you and so a division one quarterback should play well in that situation and the fact that they finally did after how many ever years where you know i mean years years and years I remember watching um christian chapman when he was playing i think it was his uh, junior year and it was like he could play and do well in this situation and none of the other quarterbacks on the roster could um, and you know, that's always kind of been the trend at state. And so then to see five quarterbacks, including a walk-on, um, Marshall Iker being able to come in and lead the, to a touchdown. Um, I think, you know, you, you got to at least feel good because you know, that, that room seemingly is improving. Um, and I think you can, you can definitely, as you said, looking at the younger players, you can definitely take that out of it. It was clear to me from the outset that they came into this game wanting to pass, showcase the pass, um, a lot of first down passes, a lot of second down passes, things that they just did not do last year. Uh, a lot of RPOs that ended up being more the P than the R. Where, <laughs> you know, yeah. in the regular season, it's a lot more R than P. Uh, and yet on, thir on Thursday night, it was it just seemed like, it might have been an RPO called, but the quarterbacks were knew that they were going to pass the ball, mm -hmm. and which is fine, I think, for this setting, right? And I think being decisive, throwing to the first guy, having the guy be open down the middle, you know, using the middle of the field is was such a underutilized part of the passing game last year. I feel like the majority of the big passing games and plays last year were you know, jump balls, 50, 50 balls, shoulder, back shoulder fades to the outside. And there's, there's just a lot open and down the middle of the field that they did not use. And I think that comes with accuracy that comes with decisiveness because, you know, guys might be open, but quarterbacks might be hesitant to throw down the middle because there might be a linebacker dropping into the coverage they don't see, or they might have a safety that's rushing in that they don't see. Right. So it's a lot safer that they're outside when it's only man-to-man -man coverage. And, I, and for the that passing offense to really flourish, they need to use the middle of the field. And for one night, 
whatever you want to make of it or whatever stock you want to put into it, they were able to do that pretty well. Yeah. And I, I will say the only caveat that I would add to that, because I completely agree. And I, I was, um, again, I mean, uh, there's a, there's a lot of weird parts about last season that didn't go the way you would think that they would, because um, going into the season, what we had seen from Brookshire is that he never went to the outside. All he did was go up the middle and to his detriment. And so the thought was, can he pass a little bit of the outside? And he almost completely left it except for the Boise state game where it somehow came back and was wide open again. You know what I mean? Uh, And then this is the caveat, the team, you know, I think it was 200 yards to 104 Um, team Pumphrey had a 200 yards team um, side by 104. But when the quarterbacks for team site got in trouble, they threw the ball up to Jesse Matthews and he didn't make a catch, but he had opportunities that is the best play when the Aztecs are in trouble. Let 45 try to out jump somebody, try to get his hands on there. And so I thought that they made an effort. Um, I think it was Crum missed him on a slant that, that may have gone for a touchdown, you know, and so they had some chances with them. He threw the, he, he found them, but he just missed them. Um, and so I think that giving him those opportunities, I think is really, really good because you can, you can want to be dynamic. You can want to spread the ball around, but gosh, you, they cannot go through as many games as they went through last year and not get the ball to Jesse Matthews. He's too good. You know, he's just too good. He's just too good. And, and him, he only had two receptions, but you know, he, they, he had other opportunities, but tell me about Breon Penny, man. You had, you had a lot better view than I had on, on his work, man. How was his evening? His evening was phenomenal. I mean, outside of just three touchdowns, I think he had six catches overall. Um, he was consistently beating his guy off the line of scrimmage. A lot of those, you know, RPO slants we were talking about, he's gaining that separation off the off the line of scrimmage that's giving the quarterback the the passing window to hit him in stride. Now he didn't, I don't think he had a lot of yak yards, um, but he had opportunities to catch in stride, which is another thing that a lot of the receivers didn't have last year. So he's got that athletic ability. He's got that speed. He's got the talent to, to get separation and potentially uh, have some openings down the middle for uh, not just, you know, the catch and go down, but to, to, you know, get some yards after catch that his second touchdown that was on the sideline where he went up in the air over two defenders, caught it, and got the toe tap, you know, the toe tap in, he got two, um, both toes in both feet in, <laughs> sorry. Um, it was, it was uh, both toes on which foot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> both feet, all 10 toes, all 10 toes. Yeah. Um, Don DeMars, our, our photo guy got a great shout out shot. to Don, man. Yeah. Well, he was everywhere shot, last night, but he got a great shot of, of the feet oh, yeah. inside the lines. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's exciting because I think since the moment Breon Penny, you know, came on campus, given the bloodlines, you know, people have been expecting breakout from him. And it's a, only a spring game. It was interesting. Um, after the game ended, we were waiting for the uh, the interviews to start. And I was, you know, standing next to Kirk Kenny from the San Diego Union Tribune. And we were kind of talking about, you know, Penny's, you know, the breakout. Right. And Kirk said something in very smart. He said, you know, he's seen guys show up in the spring game and have monster games and never to be heard of again. Right. So a spring game is, is just one game and one performance, but I think we both agreed that, you know, we're going to be hearing about Mr. Penny come September. And I think he's going to be a big part of that, of that passing game to go with Matt, Jesse Matthews, um, Tyrell Shavers, and then a bunch of other guys right behind them that some of them looked good yesterday. Coach Hope talked about how he liked um, how, how the young guys were doing. So the, the, the possibilities are endless with the receiving core, I believe. Yeah. And I, I would just piggyback on it. First of all, obviously it does not surprise me in the slightest that Kirk Kenny was saying something smart. Um, one of the best, I will say though, that when Elijah Cody came onto the show and he said, listen, watch out for Breon Penny, 
you got to remember he was a quarterback. He's only three years into this position and now he's got the technique and now he knows how to where his feet need to be. And he knows all the things he needs to do to allow the explosiveness that we've all seen to be able to shine. Um, and so for him to say that, and then for Penny to respond with a three touchdown game um, again, another shout out to Don Don made it to every single practice that was open to the media um, to take pictures, to make sure that, that this hundredth season was fully documented, um, you know, from a media EVT perspective. So uh, Don made that commitment to, to being able to get out there um, and, oh, he got that shot of, of Breon bringing his both feet down in bounds. I mean, it was like, you know, you, you could, you could, if, if it was in an actual game and they went to the, they went to the booth and they were listening and they wiped it off. His picture would be the picture that ever would be <laughs> like shared a million times on social media. Like it here, look, both feet are in both feet are in. Um, so it was just a perfect shot. He also had a great shot Don did of um, Tyrell Shavers with um, first the first touchdown of the game with the sun kind of setting behind them. Um, so there's a lot of really, really good shots that, that were there. Um, but I agree that the, there's, there's a great, there's great excitement around them. Um, another a local kid, TJ Sullivan, um, he had some receptions. It's great to see him out there. I think he has a world of talent. Um, and as you say, there's people behind them who will continue to, to push for time um, but I think that it'll be interesting, interesting to see, um, as things develop, if the rotation at wide receiver will continue to happen or if they're going to stick to, um, you know, three, four, five, six of these people that we're talking about and, and go and run with them. Um, what did you see from the defense? Well, you know, as you mentioned, team Humphrey's defense didn't give up a touchdown. Uh, led by Patrick McMorris. Um, they constantly in the backfield. They did a great job. Obviously, with with the spring game rules and not being able to actually take down the quarterback or to sack the quarterback, you know, a lot of the sacks are called when the quarterback is near the grass. So, you know, it's not too much to make of, you know, the, the, the sack numbers or things like that. But um, several several guys stood out. Michael Shawcroft played really well. I think he led the team with two uh, passes broken up. Joshua Goins' Goins interception was really nice, the play he made on that ball. And then he returned. I think he had a 30-yard return, too. Mm -hmm. From the angle I was at from behind the end zone, he was going the other way after the interception. It looked like he might have had a lane to to go all the way before he was brought down. There are a lot of positives. Obviously, you know, the the secondary with uh, Barfield, and um, Baskerville and McMorris seems to be pretty set there. Uh, the cornerbacks are probably a work in progress, especially given that uh, Dallas Branch and Noah Avenger um, aren't didn't practice at camp because of uh, shoulder surgeries. Um, it was interesting though. Avenger came out for a punt return, but it was one of those where there was no. It mm-hmm. was just uh, he was just standing out there to be the guy, and right. I saw him. And I'm like, I didn't think he was playing. Right. 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 I'm thinking to myself, uh, okay. And then uh, obviously the ball, he just let the ball bounce. You know, he didn't do anything. <laughs> didn't even catch it. Huh? Well, you know, Ryan Wittenmeyer coming down alone. Yeah. In, in space, pretty intimidating. Yeah. Um, no, that's a good call. I would. I, it's interesting because I think that a number of guys in the secondary played well. Um, and when we had Kurt um, Maddox on here earlier, he in on the podcast, you know, he talked about finding the five best Aztecs, right? And so I I found it really interesting that for the first time um, that I've seen it, uh, Kyron White and Patrick Morris were on the field at the same time, and um, so I find that very very interesting because I think Kyron White could be one of the five best, um, and and I think he's a very very smart. Um, instinctual athletic player that that as long as McMorris is playing the Aztec, you know, what are you going to do? Right. Um, you're not, you're not going to see the field very much, except if, if, as he did last year where he got ejected for targeting, I mean, that's kind of what, what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I think post game, you had that, that great soundbite 
um, with Coach Hoke that you, that you shared with me about just, you know, how Patrick McMorris is as good as it gets back there. And I think that, um, you know, he'll be in the NFL very, very soon um, because he has continued to improve and he was really good last year. He was, he was um, on a very good defense, arguably the best player, right? I mean, that's, that, that's been your, your contention the entire time, um, even more so than the guy who's going to be the highest draft pick. Um, and so I think that, that to see his continued growth I and mean, he looks bigger, he looks faster. He looks everything that, that you would want um, when, you know, he gave up a, two receptions at the beginning of the game and they were just short little ones. Um, and you, it was almost like you could see how frustrated he was that he let anything get by him. And it was literally like a four yard game, you know? Um, and so that confidence is just through the roof, which, which is great to see. Um, but then again, like I said, you know, you're, you're gonna see how all of that plays out. I mean, could CJ, um, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. Could Sedaris Barfield, who I thought had a very nice game. He had a pick in the end zone and got his hands on a couple of others that could have gone for big games. Again, Don got a great shot of just him getting just enough of his fingertips on the ball to be able to prevent uh, completion. Um, you know, could he slide back to corner and Kyron Wright and open up a spot at the Warrior safety for Kyron Wright? And, you know, somebody else has to go and play. And now you're getting, you know, Branch, Avenger, and Tumlin all playing for one spot uh, at, at the corner position. I mean, it, there, there's a lot of really interesting ideas. Um, you know, are these guys have enough of a separation between them that they're not going to do any kind of a rotation? Um, you know, you, you would be shocked to see McMorris come out at all. Um, Baskerville seemingly is getting to that place potentially, um, without having seen, you know, him beyond the Frisco bowl, but just the kind of, you know, physical presence that he is, um, and so how all that will shake down. And then I thought, like you mentioned, I thought the linebackers were really good. Vicajo, um, you know, whatever you want to say about the sack numbers, he did lead them with two. Uh, one of them was on that drop snap. Um, another time he, he um, was too aggressive and he allowed um, Burmeister to be able to break contain and to get outside of him. So I think that was pretty exciting. Um, you know, I think one guy who's kind of forgotten in all of this um, is uh, Cedric Laka Laka. Um, but he had five tackles. Brady Anderson had a nice night. Cooper McDonald got in on the action, um, you know, and to, to be able to play well um, and, you know, you didn't see much from Caden McDonald, the, the, there's just a lot of potential there. Um, and then, you know, the line I thought was, 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 was pretty good. I thought the line was pretty good, especially, um, you know, just the fact that they were going to have to play with a lot of different pieces. So, um, all in all it was pretty encouraging. Um, what, what did you make of the special teams? So the, the punting was underwhelming. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't think I saw one punt where I was like, Oh, that was, that was nice. Uh, maybe we're a little bit, um, our expectations have been, you know, heightened with, after having uh, Matt Ariza for the last couple, you know, last year, at least. So I, I can't recall seeing a pun and saying, oh, wow, that was, that was, that was nice. But th there's plenty of time to move that along. Uh, the field goal kickers, obviously, I think David Delgado had a, had a 41-yarder he made. He missed a 48-yarder yarder just wide, had the distance, but it was just wide of the, of the goal post. Um, and then Colin Hopkins made a 20, 20, 21 yarder, I believe. So it was a, it was a chip shot. Um, did, we didn't get to see Jack Browning kick a field goal. He did kick extra points, but nothing farther than that. So that that's yet to be yet to be seen. But yeah, I, yeah the punting was underwhelming, but uh, not anything I'm overly concerned about, given that it's you know March. Yeah, I mean, where where do you, where do you go from punt god, right? Um, I mean, you know, being at their, at their pro day, the punters weren't doing what a rise was doing on that same field on Tuesday. And, and so it's, it's, it's an interesting part because, you know, I think it's, it's a little bit of an overlooked component of, of everything that's going on. This team won 12 games on the, the strength of playing good, um, ball control, 
um, being able to, to win the, um, you know, not just time of possession, but the field position battle and kind of slowly wear the team down and then be able to score. And that's going to be a lot harder to do, not only because Ariza was, you know, doing that at six, you know, 60, 70 yard punts, but just in general, that's going to be a more of a challenge to be able to get done. And so I think it'll be interesting how, how that shakes up. Um, I don't recall Jack Browning punting. Did he punt? I believe, I think so. He must have probably once. I mean, they yeah. obviously score every time he touched the ball, but obviously he didn't have as many chances because his team was scoring touchdowns. Um, but I, I, I think that there was uh, more than one comment that came from um, the crowd, basically saying like, "Where's Ariza? Right? Where, 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 where's, where's Ariza? Um, You know, and he, he was, he was there afterwards, and um, I, it's just, I think, a really interesting part because. You know, if they if they're unable to just play good defense and they're unable to you know pin teams back, um, you know, just it just puts more pressure on their offense. It just it just does. And and what does that look like? And how does that all figure together to make a team? Um, last one, then, man. What what did you, what would you make of the offensive line and the fact that they weren't able to uh, field two complete teams? Yeah, I mean, I think that definitely played a part. That could potentially have played a part into why they passed the ball so much, having to, you know, play the same play, have the offensive line play on both sides and which meant they were playing every, every down other than the punts or the kickoffs. The running game definitely didn't have too many, too many open holes. Um, It seemed like the best runs came towards the, in the second half with some of the walk-ons, Nicholas Gardenera and uh, I forget the other guy's name, Martin Blake. That's right. I think Martin Blake had a 20 yard run and uh, Gardner had 32 yards on uh, four carries. So, you know, I don't, I don't recall. I think chance bell might've had two carries in a row uh, and Jordan bird might've had a couple tosses. Yeah. They didn't have much room to go. If at all, uh, Jalen Armstead had one really nice run where he broke through to the, the secondary and then the offensive line came in and piled on and gave him uh, a few extra yards. Um, but you you could tell just the focus of this game was more on the passing game, the quarterbacks and the receivers and the running backs, you know, got, got a decent amount of carries, but not nothing, um, overwhelming. So the offensive line, you know, it's tough to make tough to grade them and say, you know, they've underperformed or they overperformed given, you know, they were playing every down. Now, do you, um, do you subscribe to the kind of, you know, I don't know, doom and gloom sky is falling. Um, picture that maybe I painted in my article about saying that their offensive line is in trouble. Do you think it's that serious and they, they really could use um, a transfer or is this a matter of they get healthy? Um, they get, you know, the, the, the fool, they have that experience there. They're going to build off of it. And then in fall camp, they're going to be good to go with what they got. Is it doom and gloom? No. Can they use a, a veteran transfer? Absolutely replacing having three starters um, on the offensive line and three guys who just have never, haven't played much at all. That's a lot. It is no matter how good coach Goff is, no matter how good whoever, whatever the coaching staff is or the recruits, the the young guys are uh, having one more veteran uh, come in and, and, and either compete for one of the three starting positions or be like a veteran you know, coach on the field, coach on the sideline kind of thing um, will be crucial. Um, you've talked about it, you know, having only 11 guys in spring, you know, three guys coming in uh, from the class of 22, 14 is a low number for a college football team to have. You know, I think you you showed some data that they're usually been 16 or 17. Um, so they could definitely use another one or two guys, especially veteran transfers from, a school around the country where the guy has started, he's played big games, things like that. So is it, my impression is that obviously, you know, uh, Brandon Crenshaw Dixon, uh, BCD, you know, he's there at right tackle. Um, Alma Olave is, is set in there at, at center. It seemed like they um, have settled on Ross Ugala Masali being the guy at right guard. That seems to be like that right side seems to be pretty solidified. Um, and then it's the, it's the left side. It's the left side that both with, you know, Cade Bennett being hurt, 
the fact that um, the primary competition for um, for at right tackle was supposed to be Joey Wright, but Joey Wright's now lining up at left guard. Um, so do you see it the same way that that right side is pretty solidified, but then on the, but the left side, maybe not so much. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and left tackle is the most important position on the line. And unless you have stellar play from the left tackle, the rest of the line could struggle having to compensate for giving extra attention to the left guard, whether it's, double teaming uh, left tackle. I mean, whether it's using the left guard for double teams, which might open up the, the a gap or having a tight end chip staying in and blocking that, you know, put, to pay, puts one less player going out for passes potentially. So left tackle needs to be solidified. And if it's not, it's going to cause problems all over the offense. How would you kind of, you know, gauge that position? I mean, do, would, would you think it's uh they seem early in camp, you know, kind of the, 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 the report that we got um, was that the local guy, Jonathan Harrison was, was, was looking really good. Um, but then late, you know, Xavier Leonard, he obviously played a whole bunch. Um, I mean, is that, I guess, how do I say it? If it's the most important position on the line, are, are there left tackles who are going to be in the transfer market that are going to be able to come in and play? You know what I mean? Like if, if you yeah. could get a guy who's good enough to play at left tackle at San at a top 25 team in San Diego state, why is he transferring this late and not doesn't already have a job somewhere else? So yeah, that's a great point, but he could be a, a left tackle that's playing behind a guy who's an NFL draft pick left tackle and the team maybe wants to move him to right tackle, but he doesn't think that that's best for his, potential prospects and um, maybe as a falling out with a coach, there's, there's various reasons why people transfer good, talented players, veteran players. So you're right on the surface. You would think that a starting left tackle isn't just going to become available randomly and, and pick San Diego state people, people end up in the portal for various reasons. And sometimes it's not necessarily that they can't, they're not, that they're not good. Yeah. And I mean, I, you know, I would definitely was not trying to suggest that neither of the guys who, who are there can, that they need, that that's the position of need or that neither, you know, Harrison or Leonard can, you know, that there's some trouble there. I think that's the, the, still the difficult question is, okay, so you, you bring in this extra person and, you know, is it, is it just a depth thing? Are you just looking for, for depth? And, but then you go and you say, okay, well, if you're looking for depth, why was it necessary to not allow Chris Martinez to come back? Yeah. You know what I mean, like, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a perfect person to, to be able to have in the middle of your line right now to be able to say like, you know, our offense, you know what we do um, instead of having him playing in Tempe um, with Arizona state. So it, it's, it's an interesting place. I do think that what they did was intentional. I think that they wanted to let these kids they wanted to let them play. You know, I think that they like the idea of only having 11 of them and allowing them to get um, as much time as they possibly could with um, the coaching staff to being able to, to have them step up. But at the same time, when you're looking at this team, this still remains, you know, the entire season can be derailed if they can't get people up front. Um, and then I think it kind of goes a little bit back to the quarterback position and the idea that, you know, when you have a veteran quarterback who has a quick release, knows pre-snap where he wants to go with the ball, or has a good idea, one of two places, um, and can make that decision, he can cover up a lot for a young offensive line. And, you know, you, you might be talking about, you know, oh, they're playing better than you expected, but it could also be that, that you have a quarterback who, who can make them look better because he can, you know, um, audible them into a better run play. He can, you know, no, he doesn't make the mistake of, of um, you know, leaving somebody unattended or whatever the things are. Um, but I think that, you know, you have to, 
in your analysis of the team, you know, I think you're still looking at the offensive line and, you know, okay, fine. They're tired. Um, they played a lot of snaps yesterday they don't have a lot of bodies, you know, but they weren't great. They, 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 they weren't great. The, the quarterbacks did have to run, um, a handful of times, the, the running backs, even though, you know, it was pretty clear that they were going to drop a lot of players into coverage. Um, they didn't open up big lanes for the running backs. Um, the, there was just not a lot there that you're going to need to see from the offensive line going forward. But, you know, I don't, I, I definitely don't want to paint the picture that it's, that it's a lost idea, a lost kind of idea. Cause you know, if you feel great about three of the five positions, on the line you feel like you have three legitimate starters who can be you know the bedrock of everything that you do like you said or in the beginning of this part of it you know you can keep a tight end over there you can do other things you can chip them you can you know do other things to kind of keep um and solidify those spots um but yeah i think that that finding one or two offensive linemen um, to be able to, you know, be there for depth, be able to be there for competition, um, is, is a great idea. And so I think, you know, it's, it's, um, it's back to square one of trying to figure out who, who San Diego state looking at, what guys are paying attention to San Diego state and then, you know, where they go from there. Yeah. It's, it's also, uh, the depth and the competition is also important because, you know, in a perfect world, you're going to find five starters and they're going to play every snap and they're going to stay healthy for, what, 13, 14 games in the year. Right. That's, right. Not, that's not feasible. You're going right. to have injuries. You hope that the injuries are minor and they're for a game or two and not, you know, more serious stuff. But you're going to have, you know, guys banged up, might not be able to have, you know, finish a game or, or start a game. And so you want to be able, you want to be confident that when when you bring that next that next guy up, he's 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 ready to play, and he, you're just as confident in his abilities as the guy that he's replacing. So that's that goes along with you know, at least having one or two more players and having guys with experience is going to help out a lot. I agree, and 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 saying all that, I do see the method to the madness. I do I do see the idea of saying, look. You, you want the guys who are in camp to be the guys that are playing because they're, they have huge talent because you've invested in them because you want to see them play. Um, and if there's a position that you could go and, you know, grab somebody from the transfer portal and expect them to com- to compete at a high level, it, it is offensive line. I mean, that's, that's, that's a real thing. Um, and so, you know, maybe, maybe that's, that's what they're going to be able to do. You know, but all in all, I think that they came out of spring healthy. I think um, they came out, you know, with, you know, the, the transfers and everybody who is new to the team definitely seemed to acclimate to it, um, definitely seemed to kind of carry on that same tradition. Uh, I thought, again, kind of coming full circle, I thought that the event staff did a really good job, you know, just putting everything together. Um, the number of former players who were in attendance was, there were so many of them, you know, J.R. Tolver was there, you know, Kirk Morrison was there, you know, obviously Rashad Penny. Penny was there. Yeah. I mean, there's so many guys, um, all of the people who were at the pro day, um, I think I almost saw, I saw nearly all of them were there. Um, many of them were there you know, being able to, to have that connection. And then, you know, Lionel Hamilton, former running back. Um, I think he brought a football team with him, a bunch of young guys, you know, who they get to sit there and they get to dream about being Aztecs on that field. And the more connections you get to, you know, just that community, the, the, the culture that they're trying to build, they can, they, they, they can't compete with USC when it comes to facilities, they're not going to be able to offer a guy. I mean, unless, you know, EVT blows up, right. They're not going to be able to pay a recruit $2 million to show up at, at, at their campus, but they can have the best culture in football. They do have the ability to, they do have the ability to compete in that way. And that is the strength of their team. 
over and over again, the honesty that, that the players have when they come on and have conversations with us, the things that they say about the coaching staff when nobody's there, the way the coaching staff takes care of them, um, the way that parents see how their kids are taken care of and they have all confidence in them that they're going to, I mean, from things where like the kid's life's hanging in the balance, you know, and it's the coach that they trust to be able to be there to, you know, recruits talking about how they're the most honest that, that is recruiting them. There is a culture that exists and every coach that we talked to and asked about it said, it's because of Brady Hoke that, that it exists. And so as long as they can keep, highlighting that keep showing that that is the thing that makes them special that is the thing and i thought that at the spring game again i think um you know matt rosano whoever it is that is pulling those strings and just has that has that touch to be able to understand who san diego state is what makes them great and then to show it whoever's doing that um, deserves a race because that's exactly what this culture that we get to be a part of because we get to see it from you know up close that was on full display at the end of the game when the families came onto the field and they're taking pictures and kids are running around pretending that they're scoring touchdowns and all of the stuff that was there so kudos to to that group so those are my final thoughts that's one last comment from me you know, if Breon Penny's toe tap touchdown wasn't the play of the game, I would I would vote for Logan Tanner's forty five yard reception. Nice. I, I as I said, I was behind the goalpost during the game, and that play was obviously coming towards us, and it was right down the middle where I was. I was pretty much like right in line with that that pass uh, that they threw over the safety's head. Logan. Logan Tanner getting behind the defense, everybody on the defense, having that pass come over the safety's head right into Logan Tanner's hands. It was, it was a beautiful play. Something we, we just haven't seen at all uh, from the, from the playbook, from the Aztecs and Logan Tanner, I think it can add that ability, that speed, that athleticism at the tight end spot to be able to get behind the defense and to get the plays. He almost got a touchdown on that drive. At the goal line, uh, he broke free from the defender, made a move, and kind of got behind the, the, the corner, um, dropped the ball, but there was a, a targeting penalty. Uh, I forget who was called on. Uh, that gave him another chance. But um, I'm excited about his opportunities, early enrollee, freshman. Um, he, you know, obviously with Gus McGee and Mark Redman, looks like they're they're the one and two in terms of uh the pass catching tight ends um it was interesting to see if logan tanner can creep up the depth chart uh by the time fall comes around that's interesting um tell me where's jay rudolph in that conversation jay rudolph is up there too i feel like jay rudolph is used more as that that second tight end blocking he might be the primary tight end but in terms of pass catching going out for passes i don't know if he's at that ability that a mark redmond or a Gus mcgee showed mm -hmm. um but yeah jay rudolph will play he'll play a ton of snaps but i think he, he may end up being more the guy who stays and, and helps offensive line blocking like what um, he did last year right yeah so you were closer to it than i than than i was talking about um logan tanner's play from my vantage point, it looked like that ball was released before he got his head around. So he had to find the ball in the air. And then it looked like it got tipped because that ball just like landed in his right, like on his chest almost. And he was able to corral it and, and make the reception. It, it, it did it look like that from your angle. As I say, you were a lot closer. Yeah, I don't recall remember thinking that it was tipped. Okay. Um, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't. But I don't I don't recall that. It, it okay. Was, yeah, yeah. It was it was it was everything about it. Everything about it. I mean, that was um that was Amavai who threw the ball. Yeah. And for him to to be able to release that pass with that kind of anticipation, and then like it and 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 it looked like there was some surprise that the ball was just perfect. Um, and so that, that was, that was a, a, a great pass. Um, and, 
you know, it's just interesting. It's, 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 it's interesting. So I, I like, that would definitely be, that would definitely be up there for sure. Um, trying to think if there was any other plays that, that would have been able to top those two. Yeah. I, I think, I think, I think those, yeah, I think that, those would be the two best plays. It was a fun night all around football atmosphere, the people, I think San Diego State just overall did a great job. And um, I think people are talking about it. People are going to be talking about how much fun they had being there. And it's just going to build even more excitement for September 3rd. I don't, I don't, I mean, again, if, if you don't like football, I, I can understand you not being excited about that. But that was, that was everything that, that I think that San Diego State wanted it to be. And, and the buzz, as you say, is going to be building the the scoreboard video board is in the goalposts are in most of the seats for snapdragon have been put in and so there's you know it's gonna kind of go quiet again um as the kids are working out and then you know the the summer will get there and and it'll be kind of that that final stretch but you know we're gonna we're gonna keep covering the team year-round coverage keep looking for stories looking for things to be able to highlight but it was it was a a really really good close to I think they call it phase two yeah close of phase two and uh, start of phase three coming up that's gonna do it for us hopefully you guys enjoyed uh, our recap of the spring game uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed attending spring game if you did attend thank you guys again for uh, following and supporting us and listening to the podcast and we'll talk to you guys next time. You are listening to the SDSU Football Podcast, presented by the East Village Times with your hosts, Andre Hagverdian and Paul Garrison.